Well, I know this has been quite a week. <laughs> so many things happening. Uh, just one more uh, thing to add to the list of 2020 with this election. And, and I, um, some of you here are rejoicing with the results. Some of you are grieving with the results. And I wanted to come into this time by reminding us of some very true things. I wanted to read from Psalm 95 with you. The psalmist writes, O come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come into his presence with thanksgiving. Let us make a joyful noise to him with songs of praise. For the Lord is a great God and a great king above all gods. In his hand are the depths of the earth and the heights of the mountains are his also. The sea is his for he made it and his hands formed the dry land. O oh, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our maker for he is our God and we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. For the Christian, for, for, the, for the person who follows Christ and sets his hope upon Christ, the opposite of life is not death. See, death has been conquered for us, right? We need not fear that anymore. No, the opposite of life for us is fear. The opposite of life is is letting these things control us and acting out of fear instead of out of the hope that Christ has given us. And all the political machines, whether left or right, will feed our fears in order to get our vote, whatever side we're on. And I hope that this morning as we come into the presence of the Lord, into the throne room of God Almighty, where the angels sing, holy, 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 that we would see that God is not surprised. God is not flailing about, wondering what to do next. God is not gloating. He has made a way open into the throne room by the blood of Christ. And so we come this morning and we sing and we can sing without fear. Let us worship today.
pray with us, please. Father God, we approach your throne with humility and with joy this morning. You have made this possible, and we are eternally grateful for calling us your children and for welcoming, welcoming us into this holy, holy place. As Isaiah stood in this place, in, the throne, in your throne room, he was awestruck and humbled. Yet you made him clean and called him to your service. So we thank you for doing the same for us. Father, we have been through a week that reminds us of, of our deep, deep need for you. 
Some celebrate and some grieve the results of this election. May we thank you for what you are doing, for how you will use us where you have placed us in this life. Now that we all have voted, Lord, help us get back to the good, hard work of loving those whom you have placed in our circles of influence. Let us continue to love them in word and in deed as we serve them and as we live and speak the gospel of Jesus into their lives. And as I seek to love those that are difficult for me to love, Father, remind me of your deep and sacrificial love for me. Lord, may we never wait for someone else to do your work here. May we never think that those in political power can stop your love from healing this world one soul at a time. Lord, may you heal and unify and build your church all over this world. You have told us in your word that our unity lets others know that we are your followers. May this become manifest in my life, in the lives of my family members, their fellow church members, and believers across our nation and around the world. Lord, today we pray for President Trump. We pray for President-elect Biden, that you would protect them, that you would draw them to yourself, that you would guide them in, your, in their leadership and in their policies and in the example that they set for the nation. Father, may you bring unity to our nation, a unity that holds you in the highest place and that places others as more important than ourselves. Take away my fear. May we press ever more closely into you and give us all a boldness and a courage that is loving and humble and that glorifies your name, even if it comes at the expense of our rights and maybe even our lives. You are what we need today. In Jesus' precious and holy name we pray. We all said, Amen.
this morning, as we come to the Word, we're going to be looking at Isaiah chapter 6. Isaiah's vision of being in the throne room of God Almighty. And how he was undone. How he was laid low in his spirit. And then how God reached out, forgave him, drew him to himself, and then gave him a calling. And so this song is a response to that. And in more normal times, we would sing this after the sermon. But reflect on what it means to be in the throne room of God and to be accepted as a child of the holy, holy God. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Praise to 
is worthy of our praise. We'd love for you to come inside now. For those of you who are in the parking lot, uh, come in. Uh, let's continue to worship the Lord face to face. And uh, for those of you watching on the live stream, it's going to be a couple of minutes here as people come inside. We'll continue in a minute. Welcome. Welcome, welcome. It's good to see your faces. I'm going to invite you to stand as we read the word together this morning. We read the word to one another. I want to begin our time by reading from 1 Chronicles chapter 29, verses 10 through 13. As we remember who it is we are here to worship and who has rescued us. Blessed are you, O Lord, the God of Israel, our Father, forever and ever. Yours, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty. For all that is in the heavens and in the earth is yours. Yours is the kingdom, O Lord, and you are exalted as head above all. Both riches and honor come from you, and you rule over all. In your hand are power and might, and in your hand it is to make great and to give strength to all. And now we thank you, 
O God, and praise your glorious name. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks Thanks be to God. Please be seated. Well, this week, we, we actually celebrate Veterans Day That's this right. Wednesday, and I wanted, and I wanted to just take an opportunity to thank the veterans that are here. If you're a veteran, would you be willing to stand or raise your hand? We would like to thank you for the work that you've done on behalf of our nation. Thank you very much. Thank you to you for giving and your families for loaning you to us as a nation uh, to defend our freedom and the freedom of others. So thank you. We want to take a moment to pray, and I'm going to actually, I'm going to pray for a few moments and then open it up, invite you to call it a prayer of praise, praise to our God, why you are praising him. It doesn't need to be a sermon, just a word or a sentence, something that you are grateful for to the Lord, for who he is and what he has done. Would you pray with me? Father God, we thank you for meeting us here in this place. And for never leaving us, no matter where we are. By the power of your indwelling Holy Spirit. Thank you for Jesus, for revealing yourself to us through him. Through his life, his death, and his resurrection. And we thank you that we can call you Abba, Father. The mighty author of life who has also adopted us as his own. Lord, please hear our prayers of praise, even now. Hear our prayer. Lord God, we praise you. And on this Veterans Day week, may we ever be thankful for those who have sacrificed for our national freedom. Thank you for raising up individuals and families who are led to serve us all as defenders of the freedom you have given us in America, as well as the freedom of others who are in need. May we all be thankful and gracious to those who have served humbly in our nation's military. Please grant them protection even now as they serve here and around the globe. Please bring them home safely to us and their families. And Lord, we pray for those veterans who suffer um, from the results of some of the, the, the combat that they have seen through mental illness and thoughts of suicide. Lord, I pray for help that would be available to them through our cities, through our churches, through us and that they would come to know you and the healing power of your spirit. Help us to reach out to those in need as individuals and as your church, Father. Help us to know how to act and when to speak and when to listen. But Lord, keep us ever mindful of the greater sacrifice that you have made on our behalf for the freedom that is greater that we find in you. And while we enjoy spiritual and political freedom here in the U.S., the freedom from sin and hell is greater. And you gave everything to make that possible. Thank you for the life of Christ. Thank you for the cross. Thank you for the empty tomb. And we thank you for the gift of your Holy Spirit living and acting in us. We thank you for that blessed hope as we look forward to the day when we take, when you take us to be with you in eternity. And all wars will cease forever. Our hearts are full, and we love you. Amen. I'd like to invite the kids to head to Children's Church right now. I believe Mr. Holt is right there through the doors.
we continue, we want to come to the passage we're going to be studying this morning from Isaiah 6, verses 1 through 8. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him stood the seraphim. Each had six wings, with two he covered his face, with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the foundations of the threshold shook at the voice of him who called, and the house was filled with smoke. And I said, Woe is me, for I am lost, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a burning coal that he had taken with tongs from the altar. And he touched my mouth and said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away, and your sin atoned for. And I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? Then I said, Here I am, send me. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks, Thanks be to God. No, no, the rewards, the rewards of my work, of my work are, mostly are mostly spiritual. spiritual. Then the pastor asked the boy, have you ever thought about a life of service to the church? And the boy says, not really. I don't want to work for someone I never see and who doesn't even pay minimum wage. I thought that was cute. Well, this morning in this passage, we're going to read about Isaiah's actually seeing a vision of who the Lord is here. He sees a glimpse, as we've read here, of the grandeur of God, high and exalted in the heavenly temple. He is struck by the, with great humility. He repents for his sinful nature and receives the calling or commissioning by God to be God's prophetic voice to his own people. Chapters 1 through 5 in Isaiah have been a prologue that really summarizes the whole book of Isaiah in those first five chapters. Many current, re- current books that are written have a chapter at the beginning called a prologue, which is the uh, which is a, uh, a, a set of uh, summary of the book. And some will also contain a chapter at the end of a book called a epilogue, which has the conclusion uh, for the book. Isaiah writes the prologue in chapters one through five, and here in chapter six, he tells the story of his vision of God and his commissioning by God. He tells us here in verse one, that his call came about at a particular time, at the end of King Uzziah's reign, at his death. This king, particular King Uzziah, was one of the kings of Judah who reigned for 52 years, it says. And earlier in the Old Testament, it tells us that this particular king did what was right in the eyes of the Lord, mostly. In fact, Isaiah's prophetic ministry lasted through the reign of four kings, Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah. The term Lord that Isaiah uses here refers to the second person 
that makes up the triunity of God or the Trinity, Jesus himself. You look at that and say, how do, you, how do we know that? Well, the Apostle John gives us a glimpse in the future in his gospel, in his inspired gospel. In chapter 12 of John, he declares these words. For this reason, they, he's referring they to the Jews who, in, in Jesus' day, for this reason, they could not believe because as Isaiah says elsewhere, he has blinded the dead and deadened their hearts so that they can neither see with their eyes nor understand with their hearts nor turn and I would heal them. And that's an exact quote from further on here in Isaiah 6. And then John says here in verse 41, he says, Isaiah said this because he saw Jesus' glory and spoke about him. So here in Isaiah 6, we have a pre-incarnate view or vision of Jesus given to Isaiah. Jesus is on his throne here, high and exalted above everything else. And Isaiah sees a number of celestial beings called seraphs, or seraphim for plural. It's the only time in the whole Bible that that term as a celestial being or angel is mentioned. And he says they each had six wings, two covering their faces, perhaps symbolizing their unworthiness to even look on the face of God. Two, it says, covered their feet as a token of reverence. And two were reserved for actual flying, for whatever mission the Lord had for them. And Isaiah sees and hears them calling out to one another the praise and the worthiness of God. And they were calling to one another, holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is filled with his glory. It's also worthy to note the Apostle John had almost the same revelation many years later recorded in the book of Revelations of Jesus being, Jesus being the Lamb of God on the throne in chapter uh, 4 of Revelations, verse 6 through 11. Read it sometimes. It's quite, quite similar. Isaiah here tells us in verse 4 that at the sound of this worship and praise by the seraphs flying around the throne of Jesus, the very doorpost and thresholds of this temple shook and a cloud of smoke, it says, filled the temple. We know from the book of Exodus and other passages, as you might recall in scripture, that the very presence of God on earth was seen by the human eye to be a smoke-filled cloud-like uh, times. You remember Mount Sinai, when God came down on that mountain, it was filled with smoke. It trembled when he gave them the law, the Ten Commandments. You recall as the children traveled through the wilderness, a cloud uh, of God followed them. And when they stopped and set up the tent of meeting, when Moses would go into the tent to meet with God, what would happen? The cloud would come and over, oversee the whole tent of meeting. The cloud and smoke. Now, all that I've said now, up to this point, is context for the actual worship that is going on here in, in Isaiah's vision. For the rest of our time, I want us to focus on the character and attributes of God contained in this worship cry, this worship song by these celestial beings that were surrounding the throne of God. As born again Jesus believers, you and I must take the time to discover more about who this God is that has called us to himself and saved us from the true justice that we deserved. May God give us the grace right now to see even a fraction, even a fraction in these next 10 or 15 minutes of who he truly is. Theologian Thomas Aquinas, who lived in the 13th, 13th century, writes these words, 
Love is born of an earnest consideration of the object loved. Love is born of an earnest consideration of the object loved. Consider your spouse. When you first met your spouse, you considered, didn't you? You thought about them. You considered their actions, their character, who they were. And as you did, you grew to love them. Jesus taught us that the chief aim of man is what? To love God and to love our neighbor as ourself. In order to love God with all our heart, and mind, soul, and strength, we must stop long enough to smell the roses, as it is said. And once we do stop and linger and focus and smell, we will be more drawn and will allow ourselves to desire more of that beauty, will we not? So we linger more and focus on each of its attributes in order to allow the wonder of it to capture our minds and senses. The more we give earnest consideration of the character of God, the more we will know him, experience his life, and be enthralled or taken in by him. We then set our hearts to follow him with our whole being more and more. He then becomes our first and highest love and true satisfaction of our souls. As a rose, when you think about it, a rose is a witness to a much larger reality behind all created things that woos our minds and hearts to consider the quality of the being responsible for that rose, what's behind all created things. And Paul reminds us here in Romans 1, for since the creation of the world, God's invisible attributes, qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen excuse me, have been clearly seen being understood for what has been made so that men are without excuse. Isaiah's vision here gives us pause to linger and to give earnest consideration, ask ourselves, what is our vision and understanding of God? What does the natural revelation that we see all around us here on earth and what, and, and the special revelation that God gives us in his word tell us about who God truly is. So let us linger now over these words spoken by the angels. And the first that I want us to see is the fact that God is supreme. He is high and exalted over everything, Isaiah says. God is supreme. He is the highest in rank in the universe, highest in power and authority. He is highest in degree and utmost the greatest. Now let's consider what his word affirms this. In Psalm 95, which Neil read earlier, he says, For the Lord is the great God, the great king above all gods, in his hand are the depths of the earth, and the mountain peaks belong to him. The sea is his, for he made it, and his hands form the dry land. And David responds by saying, Come, let us bow down in worship. Let us kneel before the Lord our maker. In Isaiah 44, further on in the book, Isaiah writes this. This is what the Lord says the Israel's king and redeemer, the Lord Almighty. I am the first and I am the last. Apart from me, there is no God. Or the supremacy of Jesus as found in the book of Colossians chapter one. You see it on the screen here and I'm gonna invite us to read it out loud together. 
on his supremacy. Ready? Let's read. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have the supremacy. Amen. Now let us consider his holiness, which is declared three times here in Isaiah's vision. And the angels around the throne say, holy, holy, holy. God is holy. God's holiness means that he is spiritually perfect. He is absolutely pure. He is sinless. And as a result, is exalted and worthy for our complete worship. Isaiah 57, for this is what the high and the lofty one says, he who lives forever, whose name is holy. I live in a high and holy place, but also with him who is contrite and lowly in spirit to revive the spirit of the lowly and to revive the heart of the contrite. He is holy. Do you remember Jesus and telling his disciples how they were to pray? Remember what he said? Our Father who art in heaven, holy, holy is your name. The Apostle John writes of Jesus in Revelation 15, Who will not fear you, O Lord, and bring glory to your name? For you alone are holy. All nations will come and worship before you, for your righteous acts have been revealed. Hmm. Instead of us asking us to to get on our knees right now, I'm going to ask us just to stop for a moment and to consider the quality of God's supremacy and holiness. I'm going to stop talking and ask that you quietly reflect and give thanks for his supremacy and his holiness in these next 20 or 30 seconds. So just reflect and give thanks now. You know, considering the unfathomable greatness of God brings us into a greater sense of dependency, doesn't it? Author, author uh, Brennan Manning in his book, Ruthless Trust, says these words, the glory of God makes possible the primordial act of religion. Now stick with it. The realization, that is, that we are not sufficient unto ourselves that we have received our life and our being from another in a decision that reaches the roots of our most intimate self and demands the renunciation of belonging to that self, we freely ratify our condition as creatures. Through this fundamental act of dispossession, we acknowledge the illusion, the illusion of control and open ourselves to the reality of God. 
the angels next proclaim here that Jesus is the Lord Almighty, meaning he is both powerful and the sovereign ruler. Number three, he is sovereign. Sovereignty means that the person is, ro- is of royal position. He governs and reigns. As such, he is independent of all others. There's no need for anyone else. He controls everything and will bring his plans and his purposes to come about. He can do anything that he chooses to do as the sovereign king. Again, from Isaiah, later on in 46, he writes, I make known the end from the beginning, from ancient times what is still to come. I say, my purposes will stand, and I will do all that I please. He will have his way from the beginning to the end of time as we know it. Ephesians 1, 4 through 5, we get a a picture of his sovereignty here that I'm going to invite us to read again out loud. Let's read it. For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love he predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and his will. His pleasure, his will, adopted us, predestined us to be conformed. Also, his sovereignty is declared by Jesus himself in Matthew. Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? Yet not one of them will fall to the ground apart from the will of your Father. And even the very hairs of your head are all numbered. So don't be afraid. You are worth more than many sparrows. He knows already what is to come. He knows which leaders will be elected or chosen from every nation on earth, whether you have voted for one or the other. Whatever the outcome God is still rules and he is still on his throne. Today, he's on his throne. Our ultimate trust is not in man, but in a supreme, holy, powerful, and sovereign Lord. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. Number four, God is glorious. He is glorious. This word glory in the Hebrew thinking has several, it takes on several aspects. Early on, it was seen as a weight, an, a weight for an object, its heaviness. It also was dis- used to describe greatness or eminence, power, or the light, the light. His majesty. You might recall that Moses, upon realizing God's favor was upon him, asked God to show him his glory. You recall this in Exodus? His request was denied by God. Instead, God covered Moses' face. You remember this? Hit him in a cleft of a rock, and and his glory passed by Moses. And after it had passed by, God took his hand away from Moses' eye and allowed him to see his what? His backside. Only his backside. No one who sees the face of God lives, the scripture tells us. We will never see the face of God on this side of death. But now in creation and in each other's lives, the scripture says we get a glimpse of We get a taste of his glory. Look at Paul's writing. He says, and we who with unveiled faces all reflect, we all reflect the Lord's glory, are being transformed into his likeness with ever-increasing glory. There it is. 
which comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. When we see the character and attributes of Jesus reflected in one another's lives, we are actually witnessing, the scripture says, the very glory of God here on this earth. So where do we go from here in this, in this small piece that we've looked at? Well, God caused Isaiah to look up. He looked up and saw Jesus on the throne, high and exalted, as supreme and holy and sovereign, with the glory of God filling the whole earth, he says. You and I need to look up. We need to look up when everything around us on earth seems to disintegrate and be difficult. We need to look up and remember who really has the power of the kingdoms and nations of this world. We need to look up and see the cross and the empty grave daily lingering and smelling the roses of what it did and accomplished for us reflecting on the promises and character of God who called you, who forgave you, who made you righteous in Christ. And on top of that, as the motivation, loves you, loves you and I intensely. Jesus is the power, the wisdom, the holiness and the redemption of God, Paul writes. Therefore, do not lose heart. Though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary afflictions or troubles Afflictions or troubles are achieving for us an eternal weight of glory. There's that word again. That far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but what is unseen. We look up. For what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. Holy, holy. Holy is the Lord God Almighty. In your bulletins that you brought with you, I put in a uh, a list of, of the attributes of God. Please take them home with you. There's probably at least 10 or 15 verses related to each attribute of God. It's a wonderful study and resource to have. You can keep it in your Bible and get an opportunity to look and read about those qualities of God, his justice, his holiness, his wisdom, his his faithfulness, scriptures. Maybe as an assignment this week, take time to look at those attributes and study them from what the word of God says. But before I pray now to close this, I invite you again into just a moment of quietness that we would look up in our hearts as we bow our heads that we would look up, reflect, and give thanks for the glory of God in Christ that working through our lives. Let's give thanks. says as high as the heavens are above the earth so are my ways and my thoughts above yours 
Oh, Lord, we, 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 we feel like as we pray here this morning, we have just seen a fraction, a fraction of your holiness, of what your, of what your sovereignty is like, of what your sup- supremacy is like. Oh, Lord, enlarge in that in our hearts. Please, as we go from here today, in the midst of this world and this pandemic and this election, we ask you to show us yourself. Help us to see and keep our eyes lifted up. For we for where we are in, in union with you in Christ. Thank you for your beauty. Thank you, Lord, that you give us grace so that we will stop to smell the roses, to linger and understand who the living God is. Help us, Lord. And thank you that in the midst of our finiteness, you have demonstrated your great love for choosing us, for making us holy, and making us dearly loved. Thank you for Isaiah's vision here, here, that ju- that's just as applicable today in our lives as it was in his. Thank you for allowing us to see Jesus. We love you, and we thank you for this time. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks, Rich. Yeah. I wanted to take a few moments to just have a, a chance to respond to this word. And uh, I'm going to play a, f- a song, I'm going to stand in awe. And I'm, we're going to actually have the words on the screen at home. It'll be on your screens as well. Um, I'm going to invite you not to sing. If you're here in the room, if you're at home, sing at the top of your lungs. That's great. Um, just out of respect for one another here. But reflect on the words. You can hum. You can even speak them quietly if you'd like. And uh, just reflect on the beauty of the Lord.
you stand as we close our time together? Reading from Romans chapter 15, verses 5 through 7. To live in such harmony with one another in accord with Christ Jesus, that together you may with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, welcome one another as Christ has welcomed you for the glory of God. Amen. Go, go in the grace, the grace and power of our holy God this week. Amen.